And you'll notice a bunch of things immediately that, and we're gonna talk about some of them. The amazing eyes, uh, birds in um, general, and especially raptors and owls, they have these really big, beautiful eyes and they don't have white around them um, like we're used to seeing. So they're really just, just stare you down uh, when you get close to these birds. It's just super, super cool. Uh, and we'll get right into about osprey themselves. It's the only bird of prey um, known that feeds exclusively on fish. 99.99% .99 of their diet is fish. So in general, you'll find them around water. Uh, and we'll talk about coming up their talons and you can just look at that picture, it's incredible. Um, I would hate to be a fish with <laughs> that set of talons coming, uh, coming after me. The average time to catch a fish is about 12 minutes and they're very effective at it. They are uh, well, more than a quarter of the time is successful, which in the animal world and hunting is very good. If you, if you, or as an aside, if you want to look up or wonder what is the most efficient or successful hunter in the animal kingdom, look up dragonflies. Um, you will be absolutely amazed. Uh, here is uh, an osprey with a fish, and you'll notice that it carries it head forward. This is to be aerodynamic. Um, it's easier, probably easier to carry that way. Plus, um, if you carried it sideways, be you know, you, you know, your air would hit it, and it would slow the osprey down. And their talons are designed to hold it this way as well. And they use thermals and updrafts. And thermals are just pockets of hot air. And they, they use this especially during uh, migration when they need to fly long distances. Um, these aren't the kind of birds that flap like a hummingbird. They do a lot of soaring as much as they possibly can, um, like other birds. So they use these thermals and updrafts, and they even use them locally. Uh, if you watch them at our preserves or some other places, you can see them going up and down really quickly. Those are usually uh, thermals or updrafts. This is one of the neatest things, in my opinion, about the osprey. Now, look at that foot on the top left there. It is very formidable. The talons are completely smooth and round, uh, so they can pierce uh, the skin of a fish very easily with nothing getting into the way. And then they're hooked, of course. So when they go in, they hook in, which makes them harder to get out. And they have barbs. If you were to look, be able to look close enough, and you can even see some of them here, if you can see my pencil thing moving around, the little sticky and hooked barbs that grab the scales of a fish. Everybody that's caught a fish out of a pond knows how difficult it is to hold a fish. Osprey have no problem. They are the masters at it. And they, along with um, owls, are the only birds known to be able to take one of their toes. And it's almost um, kind of like being double jointed. They flip it back. So they end up with kind of a pincher. And so they can go on the uh, one side of a fish and then the other side with the other talons. It's quite remarkable. Um, if you ever get a chance to see them fish, it's really incredible. And I suspect that, um, I didn't see this anywhere, but I've gotten into UV photography and other things. I suspect that their eyes are polarized. Uh, if you ever have a polarized pair of sunglasses and you look down at the water, you can see almost through it and down into the medium to see fish. Uh, my guess is Osprey have that ability as well as well, or else, you know, you, you can't really see it. You wouldn't get to see the fish if they weren't polarized. So that's kind of a neat thing. They're a uh, five foot wingspan. Female is generally larger uh, and has a feather necklace here. This is kind of hard to see. Once you get really good at birding, um, you might be able to pick this out. And their wings are bent at the wrist. They, they kind of form um, an M if you can Think of the M going up, down, up, down like an M. Uh, it kind of, like it says, resembles a gull. But this pattern or design of wing gives it a lot of thrust and like immediate power. When you see them get a fish, they don't dive in head first like a cormorant or other birds. They go in feet first and they go sometimes completely under the water. And to get out of that situation is not really normal for a, uh, this kind of, you know, a raptor but they have very powerful wing design. It pulls them out of the water. Their talons um, are so efficient and can dig so deep. It's been, people have seen Osprey grab a fish that's too heavy. It's just too big. 
I've seen them carry some very large fish. But if they grab something that is too heavy, there is a chance that they will go back down and drown because they can't get their feet out. Uh, it doesn't happen that often, but it just shows you the power of that talon shape and all those um, little variables they have on their feet make it extremely potent to hold on to fish. So another one I wanted to share is their eye. Now this is a juvenile, super amazing, awesome orange eye. Uh, this was like the second picture I ever took. Uh, you can see the flash uh, in, the, in the camera and they have what's called a nictating membrane. If I would have waited half a second, this would have came over the eye as a big sheet, um, like pulling down a blinder on a window and it completely covers it and you see a faded orange thing through it. It's kind of like those things people put on their windows to keep the sun out and they pull them down like a, like a drape. It goes over the eye and it protects the eye. And the Osprey was doing it when I was taking this macro shot just to protect its eye. But you can see uh, that is just amazing. Uh, and they change. Many birds do this, but, uh, and it's not completely known why. Uh, with a lot of nature, you'll find out, you think everything is known and then you start digging deeper and you find out most of it's not known. Uh, why their eye changes color to bright yellow, as, you, uh, as you'll see at some point in this program, is not really known why that happens. There's some theories uh, why that might happen. It might signal that you're mature enough to mate. It might, you know, you might be mature. Maybe that's what the signal is. Or maybe the eye changes to block more UV when it turns yellow. I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a mystery, but it's, it's really neat to watch their eyes change. Now, in osprey migration, loads of birds migrate. Everybody's heard about birds migrating. Um, osprey do it as well. Uh, they're in New Jersey from March to October. And there's a little caveat to this because I've, I've been banding them for 15, 16, I don't know, 17 years, and I've watched them. And I, the past three or four years, I have seen osprey in January in New Jersey flying around. I, I've never saw that before, maybe three years ago. They just did, you know, water freezes, they can't get fish, uh, and a host of other things. But I'm seeing that occasional straggler now all winter, and it's, uh, it's one of many signs, I'm sure, if you're in tune at all with the natural world and climate change and so forth, you'll see little signs. You know, there's always someone, an outlier, going out there to see if he can make it. You know, that's how things progress and species move around and test different areas. You know, if it gets too cold, maybe we'll die and not make it. Um, it's just interesting to see that there's some now hanging all year round. Uh, so they overwinter from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to South America. If you go down to Florida, they don't go anywhere. They just, they hang around there all year round. It, it, it works for them down there. They do mate for life and return to the same nesting grounds annually. So as uh, if, if it's just a bunch of dead trees or an osprey, a man-made platform, the same birds will come back to the exact place. Um, now you may wonder if that's the case, uh, what happens when the chicks are born and then they come back? Do they come back to that same one? If they do, their parents are gonna be there. Uh, and, and maybe it's just like kids that go away to college and wanna come back home. At some point, the parents say, oh, you gotta get your own place. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that happens, but they do come back to the same spot. Here is their migration. Uh, as you can see, year round, there is the Florida in the purple there, um, over on the west coast over here. Summer, you can see this little edge on the east coast. New Jersey's right around in there somewhere. Uh, that's where they are right now, they're here. Winter, um, non-breeding all the way down here. I don't know, this must be 5,000 miles or something. It's really, really far. Um, huge winter. And, this, and so that just shows you um, their migration. It's, pr it's pretty amazing in this part of the, the country. So I wanna go, just share this little uh, story here. Audubon put a, in 2008, a 0.75 ounce solar powered satellite transmitter on, a, on the back of a three month old osprey named Penelope. They wanted to see where this bird went. Now keep in mind this bird's three months old. I still find this absolutely astonishing um, 
how, how different animals at different ages can do things. I mean, you think of people at three months old, it's just rolling around in a crib, basically helpless. This thing's flying 2,700 miles. So they put this transponder on it. It started in Martha's Vineyard, as you can see up here. Uh, and she flew all the way down here alone, 2,700 miles. So she touched down in coastal Maryland and North Carolina for three days and then went to the Bahamas for four days, had a martini, whatever, for a few days there, and then blasted through the Dominican Republic in 29 hours, which is incredible. And then she launched out over the Caribbean, flying all night, and the next day to a tiny island off the coast of Venezuela. A week later, she was exploring a rainforest in French Guiana. That is amazing. Um, and it must be clear to you at some point that the parent, it's not following its parents. They don't fly 10 feet from dad and mom saying, hey, catch up, that could, and it doesn't happen. They leave at different times. So how in the world does this thing know where to go? Why didn't it stop in the Bahamas? Why didn't it go to French Guiana? These are big mysteries. Uh, a lot is known about birds. Migration is largely a mystery. There's loads of theories. Um, but it is still not 100% solved. This is, uh, these, to me, tells me this osprey is hardwired to do this. There's no way it can learn this or know. Um, it, just, it just knows it when it's born that it, it goes down there. And you'd have to be hardwired to do that. Here's its distribution. The osprey is one of only a few birds in the whole world that's everywhere except Antarctica. It is down here in Australia, but you can't really see it with your eye. It's only on the coast. Uh, there's a very faint light blue thing going on there. It's all over the place, very widespread uh, and successful. Quick timeline in New Jersey in the 1800s. There was lots of them. Osprey were doing well. 1890, uh, they started to see huge declines. Habitat loss, eradication of nest sites, eggs, shooting. Just think of the Jersey Shore. There was, it was just loaded with dead snags and trees back then. Well, they cut them all down. Um, habitat went away. People took their eggs, shot the birds. Um, terrible, terrible stuff. 1930s and 40s, that continued. And then uh, the coup de gras was DDT was introduced in uh, 1946. A very uh, impressive insecticide. It worked well. But what happened, um, it didn't do, didn't do well things, uh, good things to the birds, as you'll see in a minute. And then by 1975, there were just 53 pairs in the state. So to show you what happens, um, DDT is one of these things that bioaccumulates in, or gets biomagnified in the food chain. You start way down here with diatoms and, and these little tiny plants, and then you go up zooplankton, and they're full of this stuff. And DDT has a pretty long half-life. In people, it's like six years. And what that means is in six years, half of it will be gone. But the stuff accumulates, and you can't really get rid of it. It takes a long time. So it just builds up and builds up and builds up. And by the time zooplankton have it they're loaded with it then minnows eat loads of zooplankton so they're completely full of it and it just keeps going on by the time osprey get a fish it's full of it it's just parts per million is is super high and so osprey of course are eating fish they eat loads of them and what it did is it started to really mess them up it's a poison it messed up their reproductive system all their eggs became um very weak so they would lay eggs, okay, and then sit on them, they crack. So chicks were just dying, they weren't reproducing, they were just going plummeting. This happened to every raptor, not just osprey. Eagles, peregrine falcons were devastated. Um, we came to our senses and banned DDT uh, in New Jersey in 68. In 1974, the Endangered Species Act came into being and the Conservation Act. The osprey was the first species put on the endangered species list, and it was the first to be removed from the endangered species list in 85. And here we are, you know, go ahead 25 years and the osprey are in above historic numbers, just absolute record numbers. It's such a cool thing to follow this story because it's a success story and there's lots of doom and gloom, uh, but this is a true success story and they're doing well. You can't walk 20 minutes in Southern New Jersey without seeing one of these birds flying over. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Here is a quick rebound graph. As you can see, 60 pairs way back here, 
200 pairs. Let's fast forward up and look at this graph going up. And here's the numbers. You can see them right here. Last year, there were 669 pairs, and you know, we're pushing 1,000 young. It's, it's super cool to see. Just about every platform that is made, they're using, and they're starting to nest in natural habitats. Imagine that. Awesome success story. Uh, I'm so excited uh, about this. Um, next year, well, this year, we'll find out, but it's looking to be another good year. All right, I'm going to turn this uh, part over to Lily Mullock. She can speak about this. Hi, Lily. All right, so part of what we do is every year we are responsible for um, checking and repairing the Osprey platforms. So we have around um, 25 to 30 platforms that are spread across six different Southern New Jersey locations. And we try to get this done in early March um, before the Ospreys arrive for the season. Okay. Do next slide. Yeah. Right. So most of the issues that we're looking for are structural. Um, sometimes we need to completely replace the platform, they fall off, the wood rots, things like that. Sometimes we just need to adjust the perch poles that the ospreys like to sit on or add a new predator guard to the bottom of the poles. And we also check to see if the actual pole itself is leaning and we adjust that as needed. All right, next. Um, another thing that we're involved with is banding. Um, we work with the state when it comes to banding. Um, the purpose for banding is to study migration patterns, range, and behavior of the osprey. And we basically pull up close to the platform in a boat, we rest the ladder up against the platform, climb up, and that's how we're able to access the birds. Um, we typically try to ban them between four and five weeks old. This is the best time period um, because they still can't fly but the band also is able to fit the best. If you band them too soon, the band can actually like slide down their talon and get kind of stuck and you definitely don't want that to happen. It's a really quick process. It's maybe, depending on how many chicks, like two or three minutes per nest. And it's, it's not harmful, it doesn't hurt them in any way. Um, sometimes while we're banding, there can be aggressive parents and they'll actually like swoop down at us while we're doing it, but most of the time they just fly overhead and kind of keep an eye on things. And this is an example of what one of the bands look like. Um, they all have a set number or set numbers on it and they're unique to each bird. This is how you're able to identify the birds. Um, the band also has a phone number on it. It's kind of hard to see, but that's for if you do see it or if you find an injured bird or something like that, you can call it in and report it. So one of the really awesome projects that we finished this year was um, installing a camera on our Osprey platform. And we did this with, um, by teaming up with our IT guy named Nigel. He's awesome. And we had to figure out a way to get power from the camera to our source of electricity, which was about 600 feet away through Marsh. And we were able to do this by running 1400 feet of outdoor ethernet cable. Um, that's what you can see in the right hand picture there. We had four different sets of the cable that we had to connect using a power over ethernet extender. The picture on the left hand side, that like green tube, those are PVC cases that we made to kind of house the connectors. That way they were weatherproof, we didn't have to worry about them coming apart, things like that. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, uh, on the right hand side, that is Nigel running some of the cable through the marsh. We actually had to run it um, through two like bigger plots of marsh and underneath one of the trails that we have our, at our preserve. And for the actual camera itself, we added a small extension to the existing perch post. Um, we did that so you could get a better view of the nest and kind of a more wide view of the preserve itself. And we covered the top of the camera with some of those bird spikes just so the osprey wouldn't sit up there and add excess weight. And the camera is, um, you know, completely weatherproof. So and it has kind of night vision. <laughs> All right, 
And so this is a close up of uh, the, what the camera looks like. And on the right hand side is the location where we had the source of electricity that we had to make sure the ethernet cables could run to. Uh, we actually weren't 100% sure that this setup would work. It was kind of like a little experiment for us. Um, we were actually pushing the ethernet cables to their absolute maximum. So we were a little nervous about that, but in the end, everything ended up working. We were really excited. This was actually the moment that I captured when it worked and Nigel was super excited. It was awesome. And the final steps after this basically were just installing a modem and getting Wi-Fi, which allows us to stream it live. And actually the morning that I went to go meet the Xfinity representative to get this all set up, get everything squared away, it was the day that we were planning on going live. And unfortunately, Kate May had a tornado warning. So I uh, got, got everything squared away with the Xfinity guy. I, I text Damon, my boss, that everything's set up, we're ready to go. And about 10 minutes later, he gives me a call and he says, why is the skyline vertical? I'm like, what are you talking about? We just, we just set it up, everything's fine. And he's like, no, the skyline is vertical. Well, it turns out there was a gust of wind that was about 75 miles per hour and it knocked over our platform 10 minutes after getting everything set up. It was really ridiculous. So we, me and Damon had to go out there in our waders and he stood on one side of the platform with a rope and pulled and I stood on the other side of the platform with a really long um, two by four and just kind of shoved it as hard as I could. And we eventually got it up, the Ospreys came back. We were worried for a minute that they were not going to come back and nest there, but they came back and now we have this awesome camera that we get to share with all of you. So here, here is a, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Lily. That was fantastic. And it really is the, um, the maximum of you could run an ethernet cable. And our, I've, I've never seen our IT guy that excited to, uh, to see it work. Now that we know it works and that concept works, um, we can have other cameras up to 1500 feet, a tad bit more away with just one cable. It has the power inside the cable to run everything as well as the ethernet. It's pretty neat. Here's a screenshot from the same platform and camera um, that we designed. You can see we got, Hang on a second. All right. I think I must have lost you there for a second. Okay, so this is a screenshot from uh, our platform and our camera. You can see the eggs down at the bottom there. What's neat about it is you can watch these birds um, throughout their entire life cycle. We got to watch them with the eggs. We got to watch the babies come out. Um, we can manipulate the camera. We can zoom in, we can pan, we can, um, and it has a, a great function. You can practically zoom into the eggs and still see them. It's been fascinating to watch this uh, with the life history live um, right in front of you. They usually lay three eggs, once in a while four. Uh, both parents will incubate them. If you watch uh, the camera, um, you can see her sometimes get off and he, he'll come in and, and sit on the eggs while she goes and hunts or does other things. So they're both doing that. Uh, Lily pointed out earlier that the the male a lot of times comes and brings uh, lots of branches in all the time, but she ends up organizing it. Um, not too different, uh, I suppose, from some of us. Here's a picture of the mom feeding the chicks. It's fish, obviously, um, just pulling it out raw and feeding it to them. And as we noticed this year, the loudest birds get fed first. And within our group, there is, uh, and you'll see uh, shortly here, there is a runt that we suspect will be fine, but uh, isn't as aggressive. And so it gets fed a little bit later. The chicks will hatch in about 30 days, 35 days, somewhere around there. We had a little uh, 
pool going in our office, see who could guess what uh, time uh, the chicks would come out. And they're not all at once. It's like every other day, every couple of days, uh, another egg will hatch. Uh, parents feed them fish. And if you look dead in the center there, compare that little guy to the one on the left. Uh, and that's, this is a pretty recent shot, um, either from today or yesterday. This is what they look like. Uh, so in from hatching out uh, 60 days later, these birds will be as big as the adult. Uh, and with any luck, we will get to see them take their first flight. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so they'll remain with the parents for a couple months and then they, they, like I was saying earlier, when they migrate south, they won't follow, they won't go with the parents. Um, they'll, they'll go down there on their own. And as you can see here, if you just go to our website um, right now or when we're done, um, TNC New Jersey, I mean, Google brings it right up and you click on the Osprey cam, you can see um, what we're talking about with this camera. I'm going to see if I can bring it up. I did have it up earlier. Give me a second. This is what it currently looks like uh, if you were to like watch it live. That is right now as we speak. So you can watch these birds live out their life cycle, watch them through the storms, all the troubles and travails they have, as well as the really cool stuff. It's been, uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience uh, to be able to watch. We're all rooting for them um, and hope all goes well. So in another month and a half, these will be huge and ready to take off and we'll pan out and get to watch uh, some of their first flights, which is gonna be super cool. Great. Um, Damon, thank you. Um, I'm going to, we've had some questions emailed and um, some questions in chat. I'm thinking if you could just keep the wildlife cam streaming and then I'll read the questions to you and Lily to answer. All right. Okay. First question. If there were only 60 pairs in 1972, Hasn't the lack of biological diversity hurt the species? Um, I, I would say not, only because uh, they're doing fine, but I don't know what the ratio or limit is. I do know at some point uh, they were struggling to figure this situation out. So what they did, um, biologists went to Maryland where the osprey were doing better and they took I'm not gonna know the exact number, but let's just say 30 eggs from Maryland. Um, and they brought them over to New Jersey. They took New Jersey osprey eggs off the nest, slipped the Maryland ones in. They tried to incubate the New Jersey ones in case they were viable. And the osprey raised these chicks. Some got predated, some didn't, some made it and some fledged. There was a, I don't know, about a third of them or something like that that actually made it. So they that you know they're from a different um, a different state, different pool. Um, that's all I can think of that helped it. Um, I don't I don't know what the threshold is as far as when you get down to so many species that all of a sudden the gene pool is too close and you end up having issues. Um, but bringing other eggs in certainly did help. So next question: um, Do osprey eat? Um, fish from the marsh or also fish from the ocean? Both. They will eat from the bay, from freshwater. Uh, I've seen them out over our beach, more so uh, in, the, in the Delaware Bay and the ponds. But I have seen them catch stuff out. Um, if you go to our Cape May and go on our beach, you're standing right in front of the Atlantic. And I've seen them go down and grab fish there. Um, how long do they live? In captivity, they had one live 25 years, uh, but in the wild, it's far less than that. As you can know, in the wild, it's um, everything is, is so many things that could possibly happen. Probably 10, 15. Okay, uh, the next one's two questions. Um, what is done to keep the platform from falling again if another gust of wind comes through? Oh, good question. So, <clears throat> Next to the platform, not far from where you saw me standing with a rope, we pushed a six by six about 10 feet into the mud. 
until it wouldn't go any further at an angle away from the platform. And then we attached a two by eight to that board, to the platform. We bolted it both sides. So it would have to either break the bolts or pull that six by out of the marsh, which is almost impossible. Um, so we're hoping that that holds it. And we, we don't do that on every platform, but we're gonna do it um, probably even improve on that a little bit this year because platforms that over time, uh, the ones that I've been banning, it, they just end up basically in the water. You may have started putting it, and when we put this one in, it, was, it wasn't even really muddy. But now when the water's up, it's in the water. So it, it kind of loosens the mud and makes it easier to fall over. But if you support it externally with other stuff, and you make sure you have a lot of predator guards on it because you don't want something walking up the board but that's what's holding this one, a two by eight okay. to another and, piece of wood. Um, next question is, why are the chicks not tagged right before they leave the nest? If you, if you try to ban an osprey, if it's above five weeks, when you go up to the platform to do it, they stand up. Now you can wrestle them down <laughs> if, you, if you so desire. Um, any bird that I know, if you put something over its head, it will calm down immediately. And it may be because birds don't fly at night, unless you're an owl or something. If you can't see, you shouldn't fly. But in general, osprey, osprey will play dead. You go up on the nest, completely play dead. Five to six weeks, let alone seven or eight, when they're ready to fly, they absolutely will stand up. And you can wrestle them down, but what's the point in stressing it out? And there's always the off chance, it'd be your luck, that the thing will try to jump out of the nest and it won't be able to fly. And then it lands in the water and starts floating away and you got to do something about it. So after five weeks, we don't just bother. The important thing in the end is the productivity. How many young were produced? That's what uh, ends up mattering. And mm -hmm. the state can get that data directly with people's eyeballs. So, um, so I have a couple more. Um, I know we're a little over time. Um, will you be able to observe their whole migration flight? The only way you can do that is if you tag them with a satellite transmitter and we're working on that we're working on getting one of these chicks a satellite transmitter uh if we can pull it together fantastic uh you know and, and fingers crossed hope for the best they've done this with other animals and owls and it's great or it's tragic you don't know what's going to happen it's in the wild but we would love to be able to follow one of these with a satellite the technology is here uh and we're gonna we're gonna pursue it great um do osprey have to worry about any bigger birds or predators? Yes. These osprey, I, I don't want to get doom and gloom, but it's reality. Uh, great horned owls could take out the adult right now. They are, great horned owls are huge. They will attack adult osprey, chicks. Um, a, a 30 second story, we went to band them a few years ago, osprey, right nearby here. We saw an owl get up out of the marsh. We went over to the platform. There was two chicks that were uh, already dead and they were huge. They were about to fly, almost as big as this female you see. And the owl just overpowered them, overpowered all three chicks and the two adults. Uh, and we were able to, to keep one young alive and put it back in the nest. But great horned owl is a big predator. Owls, of, uh, crows, of course, will just distract the heck out of them and go for the eggs. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and then with any remaining questions, um, we will send a follow up email with answers. Um, so the last question for today is, are there other environmental factors beyond strong wings affecting the species as well? Hmm. Other environmental factors. I know, I know this is not so much like an environmental factor, but um, trash and like plastic waste has become a really big issues with ospreys because they'll they'll take it and they'll put it in their nest and sometimes chicks may mistake it for food or they get tangled in it um so i know that that is a pretty serious issue that hopefully we can tackle one day yeah, and i don't know about microplastics just off the top of my head that always concerns me um if you want to see something nuts, look up microplastics. I think the, the bottom of the ocean is coated with it, but osprey eat fish, mm -hmm. uh, fish eat microplastics. I don't know if that's gonna have any kind of long-term effects. I, I know sea level rise is 
killing lots of the shoreline along New Jersey, and it does cre almost create habitat with the dead post. Um, but so far, most of them that we have are in platforms. Uh, you know, the coast has changed. I don't know at some point is there going to be a limit in New Jersey when they're just everywhere. Great problem to have. Um, but um, I'll have to think about the other environmental issues. Great. Um, thank you so much, Damon and Lily. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. If you have another minute, I have a quick two question poll that I'm going to launch and we just love some feedback on today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.